it on? Well, we hear you. Yes, it is. It is on. I was saying that it's really nice to see young people in the service this morning. Okay, now I know it's on. And for some of us, our grandkids are the ones leading in things. And uh, Katie and I were talking. My Emily and Megan started when they were three. And uh, Megan's in the classroom, Katie's going to do the rec. And Emily's in the classroom. And Megan, she's going to do music too. And Christy's, uh, Katie's going to do rec. And uh, so I'm real excited about this week, about what is going to happen. As we get ready to sing this morning, we're going to take a moment. We're going to go to 545. 545. Love is the theme. Okay, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the chorus. 545 is we stand together and sing. Love is the theme. <laughs> Billy Dees 
is back home after having surgery and going to re rehab. The schools uh, in our areas pray for them, our missionaries, our military. Kenny Cropper goes to the doctor on Tuesday. Now, let me share this with you. Some people say prayer doesn't work. Linda Klein, and we've been praying for her son, Jake, and he got saved. And that's, they left right after Sunday school to go see him baptized uh, today. And uh, the Lord is changing his life. We're going to preach about that verse. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And, and Linda was uh, tears just rolling down her cheeks this morning describing uh, the salvation of her son. And uh, she's also requested prayer for her son's wife, Jolene as well at this time. Eddie Show is having some real uh, serious <coughs> issues with his heart, with his heart and with his kidney. And so we'll pray for him. Abel Alvarez is supposed to be coming home soon. Uh, Chris Nelson also is cancer free. Uh, Gwen, I don't see Gwen, but, but uh, she's going to be teaching, but she has uh, some severe back uh, pain. Pray for her this week. And then the Helen's baby, the one that had the heart surgery, uh, they thought he was doing great, or he or she, and, uh, and now uh, they, they coded the other day, but it's in uh, ICU, uh, natal ICU. And then Roger uh, Goodo uh, has cancer, and uh, he's fighting that. And then Tom Washam also has a high white blood count. So a lot of different requests this morning. Any others? That we need to mention. Okay, let us pray at this time. Our Father, we, we do lift up before you each and every one of these needs as we pray for the physical need, Lord. We, we also pray, Lord, for the spiritual need. And Lord, we're so thankful that, that um, uh, Linda's son, Jake, got saved. And Lord, he's being baptized today. And Lord, we know the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And we're rejoicing as well this morning. God, we just there's nothing greater than to turn your life over to the Lord as he has done. We ask your blessings upon this week and upon the service today as we dedicate ourselves to your service. And Lord, that it might be a, a wonderful and productive week. Lord, this is the kind of stuff that memories are made of. And Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity to participate in, in this kind of service unto you. We ask your blessings upon, upon us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us shake hands and welcome one another in the Lord's house.
told me what you told him, and I said, okay, my suggestion is going to be kind of a combination of all that person, make your contract
I'm going to change it. We're going to see verse 1 and 4 and 4. So if you'll stand together and take a candle, number 217. Oh, how I love Jesus. We're going to do the first verse and the fourth verse, and then we'll do the chorus. First and four, and then the chorus. <laughs>
getting ready for Vacation Bible School, this is a perfect text, and it falls right along with our series in 2 Corinthians. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read the whole chapter. It's 21 verses, and you'll see how uh, it applies uh, to us this week. <coughs> it talks here even about being uh, uh, of a sound mind. <laughs> and I never, I really need that this week. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I'll just be crazy this week. But anyway, it does talk about being of a sound mind right in the middle of the chapter. So that, maybe we'll zero in on that. Okay, 2 Corinthians. Uh, oh, I didn't turn this on. Did I? I do that. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. For we know if our earthly house... This tent, okay, we have a tent up here, okay, this tent, speaking of our body, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from <clears throat> heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us his spirit as a guarantee. That's a great guarantee, by the way, the spirit of God. So, verse 6, so we are always <laughs> confident in knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're uh, absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're confident, yes, well, rather please, uh, please rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well, uh, well known to God, and also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but we give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. Or if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, if one died for all, then all died. And, uh, um, and he uh, died for all that, uh, we, uh, that uh, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but he who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, creature, creature uh, creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the, the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're grateful for the scripture, for the apostle Paul, for the reality. Lord, that in, in serving you, Lord, how he spells it out for us uh, to uh, be uh, representatives or ambassadors for you. Uh, help us, Lord, to do that this week uh, in uh, Vacation Bible School. And, Lord, really through, throughout our, our lives, yeah. our daily lives, help us to do that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, the Apostle Paul starts out by talking about tents, of the body being a, a tent. And he was a tent maker. And so uh, he was very familiar with tents, the use of them, and the making of them, and, and the purpose of them. And as I mentioned, we have a tent up here, and uh, 
you know, we use a tent. It's, a, it's just a kind of a camping kind of thing. Uh, and some people actually live in tents, I understand. And uh, I, I don't think I'd enjoy that too much. But uh, we, we all understand that it's a, just a kind of a temporary dwelling place. And uh, w if we're just camping out for fun, that's fine. And life is to be uh, uh, an adventure and uh, this sort of thing. But, but uh, we find that uh, we also understand that it's a serious thing because we're ambassadors, our representatives for God and on this earth. And this uh, uh, earthly home is not our heavenly home. And so uh, with this perspective, we want to look at uh, about uh, four different things. Now, it's a little departure from my norm. Usually I use three things, but four things this morning to outline uh, this uh, chapter. We're, we first see our view of this world. Now, what sense uh, is most important to us? We, we use our senses, our five senses, our uh, smell, our taste, our seeing, our hearing, uh, the, the different things that are touch. We use these senses to, to uh, perceive what's going on around us. And uh, sometimes it, uh, our, our senses can fool us. I've heard of the, you know, you, you stick your hand in a bag trying to guess and feel what it is. It might be something you don't want to feel, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, our, our senses can give us an accurate thing, but, but sometimes they can uh, fool us a little bit. And our eyes, for instance, ever wonder, uh, we, we go to a movie and we see a movie or something on a, a TV screen, and uh, it looks like a, it's a moving uh, picture, but it's actually 24 uh, steel frames placed within a second. And uh, so our <coughs> eye sees all those 24, but our brain blends it together and makes it into movement. And so uh, that's, that's how our senses are, because our senses are, are uh, and our emotional senses as well, can be fooled into uh, uh, different things. And perception is a reality to many people. If they perceive something to be true, uh, then it's true to them. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, deals with that here. Remember, he talked in, in the verses here about the fact that that some people uh, try to put on airs, they try to put, uh, appear to be something that they're not, and he says, we're just from the heart. He says, we're doing these things. So perception. Uh, and so uh, the Apostle uh, Paul is, uh, attempts to give us a dose of reality, a, a way uh, to wake us from the dream state so that we might understand how uh, that things really, really are in the real now and now, and how they will be in the uh, sweet by and by. And so uh, that's uh, so important to have the right perspective. Now the earthly time is temporary. He uses the tent, as I said, to represent the temporary nature of our bodies on earth. But the word de destroyed in verse 1 means to dismantle the tent, to take it down. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, if, if you've uh, ever been in a tent in a big storm, uh, then uh, you know that uh, it's not a very stable thing. And uh, our bodies are like that. You know, it's amazing. Our bodies are so resilient and, and can be so strong sometimes, but yet it, it, it's, we're just one heartbeat away from death. And so, we have to understand that's the way that the body is, is pictured. Uh, not only here, but several other places, uh, as just a temporary uh, dwelling place for us. And it says right now, it says we groan. And uh, I think uh, we all groan from time to time. I was groaning uh, <laughs> last night. I kind of tired, and I was groaning. And uh, we, I get aches and pains and weaknesses, and, and we groan. Uh, the groaning here is, is talking about uh, trying to live amidst the suffering and attacks of Satan uh, while we're here on this earth. And so the question then comes, how comfortable are we here on this earth? But Peter calls us strangers in this world. Too often we can become like Lot. We can be like, well, you know, I, I'm going to go over here, I'm going to do this. And nothing wrong with trying to be successful and all that sort of thing. But uh, 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 Lot got caught up 
in the flash of the world, in the, in the uh, trend of the world. He got caught up in that stuff, and uh, he forgot to, uh, to remember God and his purpose of why he was here on this earth. And so the question then comes down to where is home for us? You know, there's no place like home. We, we uh, travel every once in a while and, and just see you, you, it, it just like, like you want to uh, get home. So where is home for us? Well, uh, the, it says in verse 6, we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. <coughs> then it says in verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, this is a very important thing now to understand what that means to walk by faith and not by sight. Is to, it's not to say that you're uh, out there on nothing. Faith is not nothing. Faith is reality. But it's just you don't see it. You don't see it with the human eye. You can see it with the, the eye of faith. But to, we walk by faith and not by sight. And then it says in verse 8, we're confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And so uh, we, we look forward to that time. And, and yet at the same time, we don't want to enhance it. We want to live as long as we can, uh, as well as we can uh, on this earth. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So we see our view of the world and then... Uh, we move from verses 9 through 15. He talks about our desires and our motivations. You see, the Apostle Paul's opponent's image was everything, and that's the way it is in this walk of life. Oh, a lot of people, they, they build an image, and uh, it's true in the religious world, it's, it's true in, in the Hollywood world, in every entertainment world. Image is everything. And you know what? I, I learned a long, long time ago. Uh, the, the, some of the, the guys that driving around in an old pickup truck or something like that, and you think, okay, uh, that person just uh, poor and, and uh, they just don't, don't uh, have it together. And then you see somebody in a, in a real fancy $60,000, $80,000 a vehicle and you think, hey, that person's got it together, man. It looks great. And there's nothing wrong with having a, a nice uh, automobile. I, I like nice cars. But, uh, but oh, listen, uh, but the truth be known, if you knew the, the details behind the scene, you might find out that the guy in the old <coughs> beat-up pickup truck is a millionaire, and the, uh, a guy that's uh, uh, driving the $60,000, $70,000 vehicle, he might be up to hock and and his eyeballs, he, he might not be worth anything at all. In fact, he might have a negative uh, net worth, amen? Uh, the bank owns everything, okay? And so you, you, it's a different perspective. you got to understand the Apostle Paul was dealing with this sort of thing. Uh, they were thinking, well, you know, he doesn't really act the way we think an apostle ought to act. You know, kind of like politicians. Certain politicians think you know, you got to act a certain way, you got to be a certain way. Uh, and uh, but uh, the Apostle Paul was saying he was just being real because uh, this isn't a movie, amen. This is a reality, and uh, uh, we find that we have a real sin nature. Sin is real. Hell is real, and so uh, and heaven is real, as it talks about here. So Paul says what's in the heart should be what we focus on. Verse number 9, it says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Amen? And if you please God, then don't worry about trying to please mankind, then that's, that's the key. Amen? And the better, the sooner you learn that lesson in life, uh, the better off you'll be. Because why? You don't have to worry about, oh, well, am I going to try to please this one or that one or something else? I never will forget, I talked to a man uh, uh, shortly after I moved here. And he, uh, we were talking about, well, over a cup of coffee, we were talking about things, and he, he, he just looked at me, and he's just shaking his head, and he's shaking his head, and he, he says, you know, he says, I don't know how you do what you do. How, how do you please all those people? I said, I don't. 
Now, don't please all those people. My only aim is to please the Lord, and then, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make anybody bad, okay? I, I don't want to purposely tick anybody off, but listen, still, uh, it's not a matter of trying to, uh, and, and honestly, he never did get the, the concept. He thought, he said, you know, he says, it's, you, you're just balancing, the, and, and, and you you got to look out for this one and that one and this thing and that thing and this issue and that issue, and you have to worry about all these things. I said, I don't want to worry about anything. I just get up there and open my mouth and say what I want to say, and uh, they put up with it. And uh, I know the secret. I'm not uh, uh, stupid. I know the secret. Y'all love Joyce and you put up with me. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And I know it. And I know it well, okay? So uh, I, I understand. I understand perfectly. Okay. So the judgment seat of Christ in verse 10 is also a very good motivation. Knowing that we're going to stand before God, and it says whether it's good or bad. In other words, it's not just talking about the bad stuff. Whether it's good or bad, we got to stand, we got to answer to God about these things. Okay? And verse, uh, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. And then it says it also in verses 14 and 15. We're compelled by Christ's love. And they sang about the love of God. And it's that same love that compels us, that motivates us. And uh, it, 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 the Bible says we should no longer live for ourselves. And verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we <coughs> judge those. That if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who should live should no longer live for themselves. Now, if there's anything that's really, really pitiful, and that is to see someone that is living for themselves. That's all they think about is themselves. That's all they live for. That's all they do. It's just, just something that they think about. Uh, how, how does this affect me? Not how does this affect of what uh, God wants to do, or, or, or my family, or my church, or my community. And uh, a lot of our problems that we that have in this world today, if uh, people would think about others and not about themselves, then it's, and it says here, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So our view of this world and our desires and motivations are presented in this chapter. And then thirdly, our attitude toward others in verses 16 and 17. Now this is typical of the Apostle Paul to lay out for us a particular uh, uh, philosophy and then, uh, then on top of that begin to apply these same truths for us. So verses 16 and 17 says, therefore, remember the, the little key word, therefore, you see what it's there for. Because of what he has previously stated, he builds upon that. He says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we uh, know him thus no longer. In other words, he says, God was with us in the flesh. And we knew him in that regard. But he says now, he says Christ is, is gone. And we live, as he said earlier, by faith and not by sight. And so he says that no longer should you be looking at, at uh, the flesh. And the, uh, from a worldly viewpoint. Uh, you know, from the worldly viewpoint, everything kind of looks shiny and new and, and big smiles and and yet, when we suffer uh, uh, tracks and trials and, and problems, and, and it, whether it be our bodies, our emotions, uh, our outward appearance might not seem very strong. But inwardly, if you're doing and living by faith and not by sight, you actually become stronger through the trials. 
Now, this can be applied in so many different ways. There's not anyone that succeeds in anything except that they have to go through some trials, some troubles, some failures. That's what success is made out of, is failures. You try something, you fail. You try something else, or you try it again. You keep on trying. You keep on uh, 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 pursuing what you feel that the Lord would have for you to do. In pursuing that, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be some failures along the way. But then what happens is you become stronger on the inside. You think, oh, wouldn't it be great if everything just worked out wonderful all the time? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> it really wouldn't. You would be so weak. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be strong. You wouldn't have any real stamina about you. And so uh, when you go through the, these tough times of life, uh, disappointments, it might be physical things, it might be uh, uh, things that you pursue in life, whatever it might be, and yet we find that uh, uh, it, it says we don't live according to the flesh any longer. And it says in verse uh, 17, another therefore. Okay? It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, that you might look at that and say, well, that's not really real. Old things are passed away. You're still the same person, same personality. You have the same circumstances. You have the same body. He's talking about in a spiritual sense, that the old life has now passed away. It's dead. It's gone. And now all these things are become new. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. In reality, you're a Christian and you've changed races. You've changed it. Uh, you were in Adam's race, but now you're in Christ's race. You're, you're a different person, a different creation in Christ Jesus. There was a young lady, and she she was actually white, but she made herself out to be black because she, uh, I don't know, she was serving some cause. I don't know if it's Black Lives Matter or some kind of matter. I don't know what it was. But she 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 uh, uh, put on and had her hair kind of uh, done to where, uh, and, and she had, honestly, she kind of looked like she was black, and she was serving a purpose of trying to do that, she said. But... Uh, but uh, uh, she had changed races. I don't know how you do that. I mean, you are what you are. But she had changed races. Well, we honestly have changed races. We're not no longer belong to Adam's race. We belong to the race of Christ. And so we, we actually, according to this verse, that's what we can do. In, verses, in Romans chapter 12, it says, Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then as he said in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we keep reverting back to chapter 3, the last verse there, verse 18. And, and I, I, I listened to a song on KSBJ this morning uh, on uh, the, the uh, uh, internet. And I listened to this song and it and, and it talks about how that we're renewed from glory to glory. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, But we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so from glory to glory, in other words, God envelops us with his help, with his glory, and helps us to grow in that grace and in that glory. And then we <laughs> then continue on spiraling upward with the Lord. And so then that brings us to the last few verses of our chapter. See, I got through it pretty quick. Amen. Verse 18. Uh, and through 21, we see our perception of self. Paul just isn't talking about the decaying physical body. 
He's talking about the decaying old nature, the old way of life, and the appearances deceiving about what's going on in the heart. Where Christ has reconciled us to God, it gives us the opportunity to be a, a part of the ministry of reconciliation, to see others reconciled as well. Now, this thing of being reconciled is a, 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 an accounting term. Okay, and it simply means when you balance the books, <coughs> when when you uh, uh, you, you you check all your figures and you balance the books, and it, it, it means the same thing that you have in the bank. Some people don't balance their books; they just you depend on the bank. You better watch out, amen. Because the bank can make mistakes, and they've done it before, amen. And you don't want them to make a mistake. Uh, it, you say, well, what if they make one in my favor? <laughs> you better look out for that one, too. That might come back around and get you. Okay? And so, uh, reconciliation. Now, truth and justice are the main elements in reconciliation. You have to have the facts. It has to, it has to come uh, together and be reconciled so that it all fits together it works out. And so this relationship that we have between us and the Lord has to be reconciled. Now, some people say, okay, uh, let, let, let's talk about mercy and let's talk about grace. And that's how we're reconciled. No, mercy and grace are, are very much present, working, but they are the ones that, that bring us to this thing of being reconciled. The actual work of reconciliation is the work of truth and justice working together. Now, you say, what's the difference? Mercy is that which God is withholding, that which we deserve, and we deserve what? We deserve judgment. So mercy is God withholding his judgment. He's saying, you deserve a judgment, but I'm going to withhold my judgment for a while. And then grace is that which God giving his favor unto us. And so the favor of God, the mercy of God, withholds his judgment so that grace might be enacted and that we might have of the forgiveness and the grace of God. But then to be reconciled means that truth, the truth of Christ, has to come in contact uh, with, with the, the fact of justice, the justice of God has to be satisfied. And how did that happen? When Jesus died willingly on the cross. When he died on the cross, uh, it, it, justice was demanded, a payment for sin, and that's how he paid our sin. He who knew no sin, uh, was uh, he, he had... Uh, uh, died for our sins so that we might be reconciled. Verse 21, he had made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now that's a, a, a very profound statement. Charles Spurgeon calls this one verse the heart of the gospel. The entire gospel can be summed up in this uh, one verse. He who made him to who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so uh, Psalm 85, verse 10 says, Mercy and, and truth have met together, and righteousness and peace have kissed one another. So Jesus lived a totally pure life, and some, something that's never been done before, and never will be done uh, ever again. He's the only one that's been perfect. And yet he, he, he was numbered at, among the transgressors, as Isaiah tells us. And God laid on his shoulders the punishment of our sin. And because Jesus lived a totally sinless life, he was able to become our substitute, our sacrifice. You say, well, preacher, how, how do you know that to be true? Well, the Bible is a progressive revelation, meaning God progressively uh, reveals unto us his way, his will, the, 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 the way of, of, of 
his salvation. And so way, way back when man first was on this earth and God began to deal with man and his sin, immediately he put this thing of what's called a substitution into play. There was a, a scapegoat. There was a, 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 a sacrifice made for sin. You think, well, that's gross. Yes, it was meant to be gross. It was meant to be uh, uh, just absolutely horrid for uh, the fact that an innocent animal uh, would have to uh, uh, be killed as a sacrifice for sin. And yet it, it, uh, it, the, it, it served its purpose. You say, well, that's terrible. Yes, but it served its purpose in the fact that it, it drew us to the fact of understanding, uh, revealed an understanding of how that we need a substitute. We need a sacrifice. And then we come down to uh, the commissioning of our, of our uh, uh, VBS workers in just a minute. Because we're ambassadors or representatives for Christ. Verse 20. And God is pleading through us, be reconciled to God. So God uses us. We, we become instruments of God, representatives of God. And so when, when we, when we uh, uh, stand up and teach or, or as uh, we sing uh, the different things that we do in serving this week, we are, uh, we're representatives of Christ. And what a what a joy that is! Just think, we we actually become His representatives. We actually become people that God can use for His glory. What a privilege it is! But as we understand the <coughs> sacrifice of Christ, the only way to be saved is to trust Christ as your personal Savior. Would you stand with us with our heads bowed this morning? <coughs> Our Father, we ask your blessing upon this time together. Lord, as we understand, it's a time, Lord, when you speak to our hearts. It's a time when you, when you tug at our heartstrings. Lord, we, we put aside other things of this world. Lord, that we might concentrate on the fact that we are breathing your air this morning. We're living on your earth. We're, we're living the life that you've given us. So, Lord, help us now to, to uh, ask of your forgiveness and turn our life over to you this morning. Lord, we thank you for dying for our sin. We thank you for loving us in so many different ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What number? Number 134. Jesus paid it all. 134 as we sing together this <laughs>
not just decorating their classrooms. These teachers are, have prepared their lesson plans. They've uh, looked at and decided to make decisions as to what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and have really, really poured themselves. They're not just walking into a classroom and opening up a book or something like that. They're really preparing themselves for the service of the Lord. And, uh, and that's the reason why ours is so successful every year. The Lord uh, truly blesses us, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful time. It really is. All right, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Klaus, could you pray for us at this time, please? Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to proclaim your word, Lord. Please give us strength, give us wisdom, give us the interface, the ability of the children to reach them, Lord. To teach them what you want them to know, Lord. May we live to be able to do it, Lord. Be with everyone who is involved, Lord. Give them the strength and the wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. If you're able to stay and help us, we appreciate it very much. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.